All right, we're back. So I'm going to make this easy right from the start. This is going to be one of your quiz questions here. The methamphetamine abuse patterns. So let's fire this thing up. I got to play some games with my screen. Low intensity abuse, binge abuse, high intensity abuse. Those are your three abuse patterns with methamphetamine. So what is low, low intensity abusers? That slide's acting really strange there. I don't know why it's doing that, but let's just go like this. Let's shrink me up a little bit here. And tuck myself down here. So, low, low intensity abusers. Okay, so, low intensity abusers swallow or snort the methamphetamine. They desire extra stimulation to complete a task. They basically take it to lose weight. Not all of them, but some of them take it to lose weight. And these folks frequently work, raise families, and otherwise function normally. So let's look at this abuse pattern. Low intensity abusers swallow or snort it. So what type of effect does that have on the body? Remember we talked about delayed onset? With marijuana, if you ingest marijuana like you eat it, it's got to go down into your stomach, get absorbed into your bloodstream, go to your heart, go to your brain, right? So there's a delayed onset for the high. Same thing with methamphetamine. If you if you swallow it, same same effect, right? It's not same effect. I mean, it's got to go through the same process. If you snort it, right? If you have this, uh, take this pen out, take the cap off. Snort meth goes into the nasal cavity, which is very absorbent in the nasal cavity, but it still has to get into the bloodstream, to the heart, to the brain delayed onset. So this, this high that these people are experiencing is more of a, um, energy, more energetic. And, and that's why they can like students will take this truck drivers will take this people that are looking to basically, they're looking for extra stimulation and, and a lot of women take it to lose weight. So remember the female bodybuilder I showed you, that's what she was taking this for. She was looking for extra stimulation to work out and she was also looking to cut fat and, and because it's a stimulant and it raises blood pressure and raises your respiration, raises your heart rate. It raises like, um, dumps adrenaline into your system. We'll see, we'll, we'll see that coming up here, but these people can function normally. They're just sometimes really, really wired. Like you could probably get the same effect. I'm thinking by drinking a lot of energy drinks where you get that wired feeling and, Again, I'm not sure. I'm just saying that uh, these people can function pretty much normally because it's not causing the effect that binge or high intensity use does. So let's move on to that. Let's go on to binge abusers. So like low intensity abusers, we basically say that they are on the doorstep to binge abuse. And what I mean by that being on the doorstep is that they're basically standing there and as soon as they choose to inject or smoke methamphetamine, the effect on the body is entirely different. <clears throat> so the, the first time you inject or smoke methamphetamine, <clears throat> hang on, I got to drink something really quick. All right. The first time you inject or smoke methamphetamine you experience a euphoric rush that's psychologically addictive. Studies have shown, <clears throat> oh, wow. Studies have shown that the first time a person injects or smokes methamphetamine, there are so many chemicals dumped from the brain that it will take seven years to recover. Like that's powerful. Seven years to recover all those chemicals that were dumped that first time. So these people are chasing that high. Like if, can you imagine if you're having problems in life, you're depressed and all of a sudden you take the most powerful stimulant there is <clears throat> and experience a euphoric rush. That is the most powerful rush you will ever experience. 
and then you have to go back to, to normal, boring life. That's why this drug is so addictive. <clears throat> a Minnesota study showed that the relapse rate for meth addicts in treatment in a clinic in Minnesota was 93%. So that means you take 100 addicts that were in this treatment program, and 93 out of 100 would relapse on the drug. That's how powerful it is. That means seven actually got through without relapsing. <clears throat> Very powerful. So right down here, oh, sounds like my phone. I turned it on during the break. This is the called the meth cycle of abuse, binge cycle of abuse. They're rush, they get a rush, they get high, they binge, they tweak, they crash, they go to a, a level of normalcy, and then withdrawal. That's a binge abuser. That's the binge cycle of abuse. <clears throat> what does it look like? Let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> this is one of the most fascinating slides um, and w one of the most fascinating looks at an abuse pattern, the binge abuse pattern of methamphetamine, because this lays out in a graph exactly what a meth user is experiencing if they are smoking it or if they're injecting it. <clears throat> That'll be one of your questions is um, what means of ingestion will cause a, euphor a, a euphoric rush, <clears throat> smoking and injecting. So look at this, a rush. A rush is the euphoric rush um, of the, the brain dumping these chemicals. And what, what chemicals are being dumped? They, there's adrenaline, that's the fight or flight drug. There's um, <clears throat> levels of dopamine. Um, there's, it's escaping me. Let me look at it really quick here. All right, so I had to just make sure I wasn't given bad information. So it is that when I say the adrenaline, it's the norepinephrine uh, and the dopamine that are the two primary drugs released when you take meth. So <clears throat> when you, when you take the drug and you get that rush, that rush lasts for five to 30 minutes. Now, what I'd like to do is compare it with, with crack cocaine, which we're going to talk, talk briefly about cocaine, but we're not going to go into the depth that we do with methamphetamine because, because cocaine is a stimulant. The effects are a lot, um, this, a lot the same, but meth is produced in a lab. It's all like, it's all drugs and chemicals. It's uh, produced clandestinely. <clears throat> so it's chemically produced where cocaine actually originates from the coca plant. And so it's organic or it comes from the earth. And then chemicals are used to extract the alkaline, the alkaloids or alkaline of cocaine. So I'm going to compare this with crack cocaine just to show you the effect. So if, um, let me find my crack pipe here. All right, so I got my pipes here. <clears throat> As a side note, when I when I we talk about drug paraphernalia, right? This this meth pipe, like I actually made a couple of these. I just got like test tubes, and then you heat up the end, and then you blow on it, and you actually can create make a pipe. So it, it's unused, of course. And the pipe I showed you that was dirty. That was actually sugar that I melted in the pipe, just to make it look more authentic. But the paraphernalia shops like High Times and Drug, par drug um, Paraphernalia Boutique, they will actually sell meth pipes, the, the pipes with the little balls in the end. And I went in there um, one time and I actually bought a couple of meth pipes. Well, they're just glass pipes, right? They're not meth pipes. But <clears throat> I asked them, so you sell these water pipes, right? You sell these and you can smoke tobacco and you do sell tobacco here. What do you sell? And they have hundreds of these fancy pipes, right? This is actually, this is an antique crack pipe, but they sell fancy pipes at these paraphernalia shops. I said, if you can smoke tobacco in the, in the water pipes, what do you smoke in these glass tubes? And she said, well, you could see her thinking like, okay, like how am I going to get out of this? Cause I can't sell drug paraphernalia. It's still illegal to sell drug paraphernalia. 
and I'm sure drug shops or paraphernalia shops, and there's a lot of them now, are looking to make sure they don't say the wrong words, right? In case they're, there's an undercover sting, right? <clears throat> so I said, what do you smoke in these glass pipes? She goes, well, I've heard that you can smoke eucalyptus oil. I go, oh, eucalyptus oil. Um, do, well, do you sell that here? If I, like, if I come to a store and I buy a pipe, you, it would be natural that you would sell eucalyptus oil so I could leave here and use it. Like, I don't have to go to a store. And so she's like, well, I heard you can use smoke eucalyptus oil. And I said, well, do you have it here? And she goes, no. And I said, well, where do you get eucalyptus oil? She goes, well, I think maybe at a health food store. So that's just a side note on how they get around selling glass pipes. <clears throat> so let's go back to our binge cycle of abuse. Crack cocaine, methamphetamine, right? Crack cocaine, a rock of crack for 20 bucks depending on my tolerance and how long I've been using and how my body, like everybody's body is different, right? But on average, a, a rock of crack cocaine will get you high for 45 minutes to an hour for 20 bucks, 20 bucks. Let's say it's, you're high for an hour. It's actually closer to 45 minutes or so, but, and that's why when people go on crack binges, like they can spend a lot of money on crack. As a matter of fact, I talked to a girl. She was a 13-year-old prostitute, run away from home, and I asked her how, how expensive her crack habit was a day. She said $120. So that's five that's five rocks, $20 a rock. Um, and like methamphetamine is sold. like So this $20 rock, 250 milligrams or a quarter of a gram, right? Basically 250 milligrams. Same with meth. 250 milligrams or a quarter gram. So her habit was five rocks a crack a day. That's $20. She's a 13 year old prostitute. And how do you think? Well, obviously we know how she is 40 and $120 a day, but that's pretty pathetic. That's a pretty heavy addiction. So for the same price for $20, if I smoke my crack, I have a euphoric rush for about seven minutes. It's like three to seven, seven to 10 minutes or so. My high lasts 45 minutes to an hour for 20 bucks. Methamphetamine, 20 bucks. My rush is five minutes to 30 minutes. That's a euphoric rush. My high lasts four to 16 hours for that same 20 bucks. That's why I would ask these folks on the street, like the black and African-American crack users, like what, like why wouldn't you try meth? And, um, I told you how, what some of them said. One guy did say, he goes, you know what? I tried meth and it was like scary. He goes, it was just such a powerful high. I didn't like the feeling. And so <clears throat> I went back to what I was comfortable with, which, which was crack cocaine. And th that's what happens when, when some people take meth for the first time when they smoke it. And generally smoking it is usually the next easiest transition from eating it or snorting it. And so you might think, well, how do people eat meth? It's really weird. And I don't know why they do it, but the most common response of how they eat meth was they would put it in toilet paper and wet it and then swallow it with water or some type of liquid. And I, I would ask them like, why, like, why, why toilet paper? Why would you wet it in toilet paper? They said because it was extremely bitter and really nasty tasting. So they just were trying to get it down without having to actually taste it. So it made sense. Because if you just, like, you, you, it would be nasty to just throw it in your mouth. And it's really extremely bitter. So they put it in toilet paper and swallow it. Some of them would actually put it in little gel caps. You know, like your little supplements that you can open them up and pour powder out. Or you can even buy empty gel caps and I've actually bought it for sports supplements where I've bought the powder cheap and made my own gel caps for different supplements and so someone will take those gel caps to eat it so that's how you eat it but the next easiest transition from eating or snorting it like most people aren't going to say oh yeah like let's just you know slam it into the arm right with a needle give me a needle let's go no it's easy to just say, oh yeah, give me a hit. You take a hit, where does it go? Right to the lungs, right to the heart, 
right to the brain. So boom, smoking and, and injecting, and you inject, it goes right to the heart, right to the brain. You know, you have to go through the lungs. So injecting is the fastest route and you'll experience the, the, the most bang for your buck with a drug. So that's why, like, you know, if somebody is a hardcore drug user when they're slamming a drug, if they're using heroin and they're slamming heroin or, or crushing pills and slamming pills or they're slamming meth, like, like they've built the tolerance up and they're looking for the most bang for their buck and to get the most maximum effect they can. So let's go back to this. So here's your, your, your binge abuse, right? And people will binge on crack just like they will on meth. So you rush 30 minutes, you're high for four to 16 hours. And then you start binging. Like you, you don't want to come down. Like you're up there. You have all this energy. You feel on top of the world. You are experiencing like the best feelings you've ever experienced in your life because this drug is basically tricking your brain to release dopamine, pleasure, and adrenaline, or, or basically norepinephrine. So you have all this energy, and you're just like, whew, right? You are wired. You want to stay up and be up there. So you start, ta as soon as you start coming down, you start taking more of the drug. And you go up. See this right here? Boom, I'm up there. I'm loving life. And I start coming down. Boom, take another hit. Boom, I'm loving life, right? Come down. Come down, come down, come down. And then pretty soon, look at this, this binge. Three to 15 days. So uh, I've talked to plenty of people, like like a week is normal. Like a week is, is, a week is average for them being up. Like how long you been up? Uh, five to seven days. And I'm talking up like no sleep. Their body is running purely on chemicals, running on adrenaline. And then the other problem is methamphetamine is an appetite suppressant, which means you're not hungry, so they're not eating. And then the, the meth does major damage. When you see the chemicals that are in meth, they're inhaling this through their teeth. So the teeth are just being consumed by chemicals. They're not eating food. And then the other bad thing is when they start when they start tweaking and crashing and the drug, like, and then they start, when they start tweaking, basically the body says, okay, dude, like you've been up for one week. You're not eating. You are not sleeping. The body is going to shut down at some point. And so now their brain is saying, Hey, whoa, like there's no drugs left. Like I, I can't get high anymore. So then they start eating mass amounts of sugar, like candy, like they will buy candy and start consuming massive amounts of sugar to try to get a sugar high. And then also during this phase here, um, when they start coming down, they start smoking marijuana because now they're like, okay, I can't get high anymore. The sugar's not working and I feel absolutely miserable. And I, and so can you imagine being up for a week, not sleeping? And that's when all the paranoia starts coming in. So this whole tweaking stage is really scary and it can last for four four hours to 24 hours during this tweaking stage, they can't get high and they can't go to sleep. So like they're in this limbo land where they're just miserable. This tweaking area or this tweaking phase is where most tweakers or meth users end up getting either arrested. They either end up getting killed. Um, they're out doing crazy things. The guy that was hiding under the oil vat, the French fry vat and the Jack in the box at one, two, three in the morning. I don't even remember what time it was. He was tweaking, man, the paranoia, like all of a sudden if you, and you might chuckle, but if you've known any meth addicts that are tweakers, you've heard about the shadow people and the shadow people are real to them. Basically in the peripheral vision, they actually see movement and they see shadow people, but when they move, there's nothing there. It's the mind playing tricks on them. So they get extremely paranoid. They're seeing shadow people. They haven't slept. Their brain, like they're ready to crash. Their bodies are ready to crash. And so, and now they can't go to sleep. They can't get high. It's miserable. This is when, during this phase here is um, when most meth users will end up getting in a shooting with like the police 
or they'll end up committing suicide. And it was during this tweaking stage that I would get called out the most when these guys would get arrested and women, plenty, plenty of women, they would get arrested for whatever crime and they would want to give up the world, man. Like when they're in this tweaking stage, meth is the worst thing in their life. Like it has destroyed their life and they're basically feeling extreme remorse and it's taken their family, their home, their life, their money. Everybody else is tweakers. They're stealing from them. And uh, I would recommend um, a movie. It's called Spun. And I actually just noticed that it came out on Amazon Prime. I'll put a link in the bottom. Let me make a note. Spun. Um, but if you, if you watch the movie Spun, you'll basically step inside the mind of a tweaker and it's absolutely amazing like how they think so um that's a good one let me think what else with during this tweaking phase they'll they'll go out and dumpster dive um like they're up 24 hours a day so like when you see dumpster divers out at night or you see the people stealing metal like they're called metal thieves they basically strip copper and aluminum uh, from wherever and scrap it. And when I was working the repeat offender program doing surveillance, like we actually worked quite a few metal thieves because the destruction they cause is unbelievable. Like the copper pipes that they're stripping out of buildings and off rooftops out of air conditioning units, they're the, like, it's not that much to replace the copper. The, the cost is re is actually fixing it and replacing entire like power lines and piping because if they strip copper out of an ac unit you got to buy a whole new ac unit and those are tens of thousands of dollars you strip copper pipe out of a house and you break it off at the ground level they got to repipe the house and so they're hitting abandoned homes they were stealing bleachers from schools like literally um, school officials would show up on a monday morning and their bleachers are gone because some tweaker stole all the aluminum bleachers and went and scrapped them. They were stealing manhole covers. They were stealing, like, if you ever go into a bathroom and you notice that there's locks around, like, the the fixtures, the plumbing fixtures, and there's, it, like, just start looking, like, notice. There's there's things, boxes are locking in all kinds of fixtures and copper and piping and um, light poles. I mean, they were, they were stripping wires out of, like out of power lines and I mean, unbelievable. Those are all meth addicts. They're all tweakers. They're up all night and they're out just like rodents, <laughs> basically just scavenging metal all night long. I worked a lot of nights on these folks and they were tough to work they, just because of the hours they would hold. You know, we got, we got to sleep before normal people. They don't sleep. They just keep going. So, uh, the other thing they do during the tweaking stage, so the dumpster dive, they also like develop like an OCD obsessive compulsive disorder type of behavior where they start taking things apart. Um, and like I could tell you story after story of tweakers and what, what they've done. Like there was a, a, a motorcycle in a living room of a house over off like 35th Avenue and cactus. We did a search warrant. It was a tweaker house. A motorcycle was in the living room totally taken apart like they'll take apart their cars they'll take apart computers they take things apart because they want to be busy and do busy things and they think they're smart enough to put it all back together but they can't so you literally have junk all over if you've ever seen a house in your neighborhood and there's junk in the car there's junk in the driveway there's junk in the front porch area there's junk in the backyard and the person's always like oh it's a tweaker but we did a search warrant. There was a motorcycle in the living room. And I'm like, that's bizarre, right? We came back about a year later, did another search warrant on this place because they were selling meth. And there was a motorcycle in the bedroom master closet, stripped, like taken apart. Like, and, and the first time we were there, we're like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working on my bike. Second time, it's like, now you got another motorcycle in your master bedroom closet. Like, what are you doing? Oh yeah, well I needed parts and whatever. It's they're tweakers. And they take it apart. Okay, so they tweak. I spent a lot of time on this tweaking phase because this right here, remember that slide I, I showed you about the largest or the greatest threat 
that law enforcement officials see across the country and it's stimulant drugs and meth on the whole, pretty much the whole West side of the United States, meth is the greatest threat and the greatest problem for law enforcement. And it's because of these, these tweakers right here. Um, other than the tweaking and they're up day and night for a week. So it's kind of funny. Um, well, it's not funny, but like I, I talk to these guys and gals all the time. Like when I'd get called out, when they would get arrested and they're tweaking and they're like, man, this, this drug just destroyed my life. Like I, I'm never going back to it. Um, I'm done with meth. And you're like, yeah, man, like, yeah, that that's good. Like turn your life around, let, let let's get some positive out of it. They're like, let's take down all these drug dealers, man. Like I can give you cooks. I can give you dealers. I like, let's clean up the neighborhood, man. Like this is torn my life apart and I want to fix it. Like I'm done with this. And I'm telling you, like everybody I interviewed that was in the tweaking stage, this was the worst drug and they were ready to turn their life around. They would give me any drug cook, pretty much usually any cook, any dealer, any information I asked them, they're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's take it. Let's clean it up. Let's take back our cunt, you know, whatever our neighborhood. And so I'd get as much information out of them as I could. And usually they were just in possession of a drug. They weren't dealers. And if they gave me a lot of really good information, I'd cut them loose, man. I'd say, Hey, tell you what, let's do this. Let's take down this cook. Let's take down this dealer. I'm going to cut you loose. I want you to call me tomorrow or the next day. I'd give them a date give them a time. So you call me on that date and time and we're going to work together on this. How many of you think, how many of these folks, guys and gals that I, I milked for all the information I could, right? Get all the intelligence I could gave them an opportunity. Like, like your drug car, your drug charge is real, but you help me out. You give me three and usually it was three. Like you give me three dealers like help me, like follow through, not just give me information, like follow through, like do a buy or like, tell me when they got a load, tell me when they're going to do a cook. How many do you think ever followed through? Like out of a hundred, let's, let's just shoot for a hundred. How many, how many do you think followed through for this opportunity to, to kiss their drug charts? Goodbye, clean up their neighborhood and turn their life around. How many called? Like how many follow through? Probably about one or two, maybe three tops out of a hundred. And I mean, I talk to a lot of tweakers anytime. Like think about it. You're a patrol officer. You pull somebody over. They're, they're tweaking. They're high on the drug. And they're like, man, like I can, I can give you the cook for all of North Phoenix. He, this guy is the main cook. And the cops are like, uh, drug enforcement. Yeah. We got this guy here who says he got, he has information on the biggest cook in North Phoenix. They'd call us. We go out there to interview him. And a lot of these guys and gals were, they were dead on, man. Like we had some cooks, like we knew who some of the big cooks were and they moved around very elusive. Uh, one of them, like I was like, I did two search warrants and the guy skipped out. Like literally they called him Marmaduke. And this dude was a cook, moved around, and um, I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll tell you the story about Marmaduke. But, uh, man, they're just, so they'd, uh, they, they just wouldn't follow through. Why? Because they would, once they crashed, like, okay, so they tweak, the, this drug is messing up their life, they crash. They're out for one to three days. And they're out, man. I got, I have video like evidence where, you know, we have cameras that we'd look through and we look through to see if there's drug dealing and all that. And there's this one guy crashed at a party and they're like dunking him in a pool. Like he is out, like they're hanging him by his feet, dunking his head in the water. They're not drowning him, but they're just trying to wake him up. Dude is out cold, man. So when they crash, their body literally is out of chemicals. Like the body will eventually just crash. And it'll crash for one to three days. Boom. It's gone. Like, they're harmless, man. They're just like, their body's totally recovering. So what happens is after they crash, 
they return to a level of, we call it normalcy, right? But look at this. See this normal over here? Look at that normal right there. That normal is not the same normal. Like see how they're starting to drop. So you've, you've heard before that every, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? Like as far as you go up, that's as far as you're going to go down. And that's exactly what's happening here. Here's your normal, or normal level. Boom. Oh yeah. I'm on top of the world right now. Right. But whoosh, boom, I start dropping. So I was up here. Now I'm down here. Now, when I come back and return to a level of normalcy, that usually takes about two days to two weeks. And it depends on the person, how much they're using, how long they were binging, how long they're into their abuse pattern, you know, how long they've been doing this. So their level of normalcy isn't as high. So it's, now it's dropped a little bit. So now some of these folks that were in this tweaking phase right here, they're like, yeah, you know what? Um, we're going to clean up the world, whatever. They'd crash, they'd wake up. They, they still wouldn't call me. But in their mind, they're still going to try to get help. And so about two or 14 days into it, they're about back to their level of normalcy. They could even go for... A month, two months, like I talked to a lot of meth addicts that were like a month, maybe two months into, if you want to call it, um, where they're, uh, where they're not using. So if you want to call it, they're, um, they're being sober, you know, sobriety. Yeah. A month and a, they didn't call it sobriety with, with meth, but kind of the same, the same thing. Here's the thing with meth, and this is what most of them, they don't understand because they don't study this drug and like what it does and what the abuse pattern is. The withdrawals from meth don't even come into play for one to two to three months out. So they're, they're like went through this binge where they've been up for a week, maybe two weeks. Um, and ironically enough, the two weeks, like I talked to some people, meth users, and, and I'm like, hey man, like what's long as you've been up? Yeah. I've been up two weeks and I'm like, ah, and then I'd be like, are you a tweaker? He's like, uh, oh. you know, where one, this is one guy that schooled me. He's like, you know where the term, um, tweaker came from? I'm like, no, not exactly. He goes from two weeks. Like if you've been up two weeks, then you're a two weaker. And so get it two week or you're a tweaker. And I'm like, ha ha. Now, the longest somebody ever said they were up was 31 days. Like literally he said, yeah, I've been up 31 days. I didn't believe him. Like, I don't know if the body physically could be up 31 days, but definitely the average was about a week. And I talked to quite a few that had been up for two weeks straight. So that's why when you see pictures of these folks, it's like, oh my, like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. Why you look like that. So these folks, though, they don't understand that the withdrawal is doesn't even begin for one to two to three months later. So they think they're going along. They haven't been using the drug. They're getting their act together one month out, two months out, and all of a sudden, bam, they start, they start having major cravings, like really strong cravings. And the thing is, the one thing that will just like get rid of all their cravings is they go right back to the drug. Remember I told you 93% in that Minnesota study relapsed. 93%. Like that's how powerful this drug is. Think about it. When you take that first hit, the first time you smoke it or slam it, it takes seven years to recoup the chemicals in your brain that you dumped. Seven years. Like you're not going to get that high. Like you could get your little high and then go another seven years and experience it again. They're not going to get that. They're chasing that. Okay. Let's move on. High intensity abuser. Speed freaks. These these are like the really, really scary ones. These are like we work some of these folks and like they're out there, man. They're like all they do, all they live for is to get high, man. All they do, like all they care about is not crashing. They they want to be high. They'll do anything they can to stay high until they literally crash, like till their body shuts down. 
they're tra- chasing that first perfect high and they're not going to get it right seven years they sleep with one eye open or they never sleep this is that cycle so here's their level of normalcy they literally binge for five to 15 days they binge until like they just binge binge until their body is done and they tweak and they crash they wake up they don't go back to a level of normalcy man they wake up they hit the drug and they binge again man they binge until they go through a tweaking phase until they crash and that's what they do they just bend this is the high intensity user man what do you think the average life expectancy is of a high intensity user five years 10 years, 20 years, three years. It's actually 12 years. Studies have shown that a high intensity user lives on average 12 years after they enter this cycle. And you're like 12 years of this, like that's a long time, but think about it. Let's say you're 20 years old. You're dead at 32. You're 30. You're dead at 42. Like there's not a whole lot of older tweakers out there. If they are, their brains are pretty fried. And and I know a couple of them. Actually, I know, like personally, I know two that were really heavy in meth. They got, they have problems, man. They have lifelong problems. It's, it's really sad. Methamphetamine is one of those drugs that like it changes your chemistry in your brain. Like marijuana will change your perception of reality. Marijuana changes your perception of reality, but it also messes with your chemicals. So you have like lasting effects from it. Um, and there's all types of different effects, but, um, problems focusing OCD type behavior. Um, when they're on it, they have like Parkinson's type behavior. It's like, it's, it's bad stuff, man. Okay. Signs and symptoms of meth use. Like if you don't recognize somebody on meth, um, other than a low intensity abuser who's eaten or, uh, eating it or snorting it like even then you're going to see that they're anxious that they have their increased energy that they're they're just uh they're they're more hyper Um, but it'll be harder to detect a low intensity meth user but once they enter the binge or high intensity phase like it's it's going to be so obvious like i've seen it with a couple of guys i grew up with one of them um like i didn't want to like really believe it at first but he was losing a lot of weight, getting really gaunt. And he, he started trying, like avoiding me when I would see him. And I looked at him, I'm like, eh. And then his wife called one day and she's like, man, like my husband, he just like forged my signature on the title and he sold our car to get drugs, like meth money. And then it's like, well, I kind of suspected it, but what do you do? Um, I, I just, I didn't see it in him. Well, I saw it in him, but I didn't really think he was going down that road. And sure enough, so... Now, years later, he's on other drugs and he's not with his wife anymore. It's just, he's got kids and it's just really, really sad. And it affected the children too. So you're going to recognize somebody that's going through this binge cycle of abuse. So the effects of meth though, it's a stimulant, remember? Stimulant, so norepinephrine, like adrenaline, like you're going to have all this energy, fight or flight. So increased blood pressure a euphoria or feeling of fearlessness like you the euphoria is just going to be amazing like oh, you never felt so good so on top of the world so much full of energy and power and it's just obviously i don't know what it feels like but i can imagine what it would feel like especially if you're you know having problems in life and you use your some for some reason you decide to take this drug and again remember drug use is a symptom of another problem it's a symptom. It's something underlying is causing drug use in it. And we are predisposed to an addiction, but a lot of times these drugs are a symptom because you're coping or you're hiding or it's uh, you want to feel good. A lot of reasons for it. So then you have this hyper anxiety, rapid speech and mood swings. If any of you have seen a tweaker, like the way they talk, they're super fast. They can't focus and they're just like talking and they're rambling and they're just like going on and on and on. And their body is really, their body is moving around almost like a neurological, like they have neurological damage, right? They can't stop moving and they're scratching, they're picking and they're like, you know, they're just moving. Like 
that's meth. And the mood swings, like they will go from crying to laughing to like excited, to fearful to paranoia. Like their mood swings are drastic. They're unpredictable. And that's, they're actually like, um, these folks are dangerous to interview. Like when we interview them, we usually, we always have somebody else with us and we're always like aware or careful that they don't all of a sudden just like flip and become like, they can be really nice and talking to you. And all of a sudden they're like, you can just see like a transformation and they're like, why am I even talking to you? You're the devil, you know? And it's just, uh, it's just really bizarre. Dry mouth and like their mouth gets so nasty and, and they're not brushing. They're not eating good. Their hygiene is terrible. Their breath is just the nastiest. Like I can still almost smell that their breath. Cause usually the patrol would stop one and you know, they want to give up the world. I'd come out and they've been sitting there for an hour, open the back of the police car. And it's like, whew, like, Oh my gosh, the, their odor, the body odor. And then their breath is just like the meth coming out of their system is just nasty. Pupil dilation, right? Saucers. It's a stimulant. So heroin or opioid based drugs, it gives a, it constricts, right? Cause it's downer. So you get the, like the needle, the, the, um, the, the pupils are really small with meth. Pupil dilation is really big. And so sometimes you can't even tell the color of their eyes. They're just like, whoo saucers and then obviously the phases of depression so let's look at some of these individuals here severe acne why do they get severe acne it's the chemicals coming out of their system like when we're doing we're going to go through meth labs really quick after the meth meth section and just so you can see the chemicals and everything and um when you see what goes in there and then you put that in your body like there's no doubt that it's going to cause acne and and um ulcerated non-healed sores like how how old do you think this girl is right here her identity is protected like i had better photos of her she was actually an attractive girl um but she is 13 years old no 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 she was 16 years old 16 years old and we actually found video um we we're going through the videos and she's she's a runaway and she was with a guy that was about 50 years old and we actually found videos of them doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And we actually filed charges for, for sexual misconduct with a minor. Like she's 16, he's 50, but they had their stories all made up. And, and he said, Oh, she told me that she was 22. And she said the same thing. She's like, well, I told him I was 22. Basically she's trying to protect him, obviously, but we actually submitted the case and the prosecutor said, like when you submit a case, they'll put like remarks on there, like, um, not enough evidence or lax jury appeal. Like they'll put like remarks when they, when they drop a case, they dropped this case. We had them on video, um, pretty much while well, they were on video, her hair was kind of covering her face, but you could tell from the sores on her body, like she had the same sores as in the video and you could tell it was her. Um, through that, but they said lacks jury appeal, uh, juror, like she appears to be over 16 years old because of what meth has done to her. She looks like she's a, in her twenties and she's only 16 years old. So that's just an example. Um, this is her, like these are, this is her elbow. So in the video, this actually, this whole sore right here is all open and all glistening. And here you can see it's just finally getting healed up. But these, this isn't acne. These are, this is actually just, these are tweaked sores. It's like the meth just, um, coming out of the system where it causes infections. Here's a sore on her thumb. Um, this guy that those aren't sunglasses. I blocked his face, but this guy also, these are not like injection sites. These are actually tweak sores. A, a tweak sore. These, that's what they call them, tweak sores. So, um, like, remember how I told you 
you know, you you arrest some guy with jeans and in the coin pocket is like a bag of meth and, oh, they're not my pants. What do you think? These people always tell me when I'm like, man, you got sores like all over your body. What are those sores from? What do you think they tell me? Spider bites. I'm like, man, like I didn't know there were so many spiders around Arizona biting people. I heard there were spiders in the jail system, but trust me, these are not spider bites. And that's, so it got to the point where I heard spider bites so much. I started when I would interview somebody and I saw sores all over them. I'd say, man, like you got sores all over your body. Are those spider bites? And they're like, how'd you know? I'm like, <laughs> because apparently we got this major spider infestation problem in Arizona and they're biting everybody. Okay. There's some more sores. So with meth, what you're going to see is the sort like acne, like, okay, somebody will say a 16 year old. Sure. A 16 year old gets acne, but a 16 year old doesn't pick the acne. Like they're concerned about how they look. They're going to put cover up. They're going to be really self-conscious of, of acne. They're not going to like get where they're picking at their tweak sores. And that's what meth addicts will do. They'll just get fixated on certain parts of the body with a sore. And they actually, because they're poor hygiene, It'll get infected, and then one thing leads to another, and they got infected sores. Like this one here. This is actually... So this is an injection site. This guy called this a tweak sore. And he, this guy was actually... This is one of the older meth cooks I ever dealt with. I think he was around 55 years old. And he was... He's actually partners with the other guy with the spider bites on him. They were cooks together. And, like, it is the worst meth I ever ever saw um there's a term on the street called peanut butter where like people screw up a meth cook and it, it produces a substance that looks like peanut butter that's what their stuff looked like peanut butter and they were injecting it into their body so when you're making meth there's no quality control and if you get chemicals off it's either going to be too acidic or basic do you know what an acid will do to your body and you know what a base, basic, a base will do to your body? Base is like, like lye. It eats skin. Like your Drano that you put, like red devil lye, you put in your drain, it eats hair and basically breaks up everything in your drain. That's what you're putting in a meth. So this guy was limping and uh, he had socks on. And I'm like, what are you limping for? He goes, oh, I got this tweak sore, man. And I go, oh, well, let me see it. And he pulled this up and, um, he was injecting in his ankle because he's on probation for, for being a meth cook. He was on probation and he didn't want his probation officer to see that, that he was injecting drugs into his body. So see his fingers, like you see that yellow residue and all that, that's actually iodine staining. They use iodine when they're making meth. And that's one of the biggest symbols or symbols, biggest signs of meth manufacture is the yellow staining because iodine like, you know, tincture of iodine, like you get hurt and the nurse or doctor or whatever puts iodine on, it's kind of yellow and stains. Well, they cook with iodine. And so the iodine goes into the air and it stains everything in a room yellow. So I could take a picture off the wall and it's like white behind the picture, but the, everything else is yellow. And so that's how I know if there's an area contaminated or at least it's a pretty good indicator. So that's iodine stain on his fingertips from the meth they were, they were cooking up. Okay. This guy here, 19 years old, hardcore meth addict, intravenous drug user, sharing a needle with his 35 year old girlfriend who is almost dead from HIV, from AIDS. Like, like they're sharing needles she's dying. Like she was a shriveled up little old thing and she was 35 years old. Probably didn't have much more than a year left in her. And I'm like, aren't you concerned about like sharing needles? Like look at your, look at your sores and look at your body 19 years old. And he goes, we're in love. Like, I love her. Like, I don't, I don't care what happens. Like it's love. I'm like, well, <laughs> she's going to be gone pretty soon. And if, and I asked him, have you been tested? He's like, no, I don't care. So he totally just discounts his life and uh, doesn't even care about what he's going through. Okay, so here's uh, some with methamphetamine. Remember we talked about the violence? So methamphetamine will create this nexus for violence. 
And this continuous cycle of binging can result in violent physical outbursts. So there was a time in Phoenix when meth was at its peak. And some of you that are older might remember, but um, like there was a mother who jumped off of the Arizona Center with her with her baby. She like whew, jumped and killed herself and the baby. Um, there's a guy out in the east side of, I think it was Mesa, Gilbert, somewhere out east that um, set his daughter on fire. Um, and... He was a meth addict. There was a guy on the I-40 driving the I-40 into New Mexico. He left Arizona and he was in a van with his two boys. And he started hallucinating and becoming paranoid. He pulled over on the freeway and one of his sons was older and got out and ran down the freeway. And got away as he was screaming like, you're the devil, you're the devil. And, and unfortunately his other brother was younger, didn't get out. And his own father stabbed him so many times with a knife, like over 40 times he severed his head. And then he basically held his son's head up and said, I've defeated the devil. And, and like, I, I, I've been to so many different scenes where I've seen the, the destruction and the, like the violence with meth. Um, if you've ever seen like America's scariest police chases and all that, like, if you, have you ever seen the video of the guy on the tank? In California, he steals a tank and he gets high centered on the median and they end up killing him. But he, he was a meth addict, stole a tank. There was another guy that stole a bus and they're chasing this guy all over California in a city bus. And he's like, there's fence swinging from behind as he takes out fences. And he's another meth addict. So like the stories with methamphetamine and the violence associated with it are just endless. And so when you ever hear something crazy in the news... A lot of times if you look, you'll find out, yeah, it was meth. Matter of fact, this here, this happened in Phoenix, Arizona. This is a a mother that took her little girl out of, out of school. So like a six-year-old girl, she took her out of school and said, well, you know, um, she said, I'm a bad mother. And she asked her daughter, like, do you want to go to heaven? And her daughter, you can see in here, her daughter said, um, I want to go to heaven but don't kill me. And she killed her. She shot her daughter. She killed her like her six year old daughter. And what, and what'd she say? She said, because I offered her to God because I'm a bad mother. So you look in the story here, it says the 26 year old former amphetamine addict expressed, expressed no remorse when she described shooting her Jesse twice in the head, wrapping her body in her tarp and going home. And she was thankful she was in heaven. Like, this is a whacked out mother. Like, and I can tell you stories of mothers that like I told you Marmaduke, the meth cook, like, um, he cooked meth at a house in, um, uh, right off Bethany and I 17, Bethany road and I 17 did a cook. And we got called out like late at night because this mother's daughter had consumed. She drank Gatorade, what she thought was Gatorade out of a fridge. It was meth oil that Marmaduke, the cook, had put in the fridge after he like made, did a cook at this lady's house. The little girl didn't know. She opened the fridge, milk, water, Gatorade. Like what's a kid going to drink? It was October. It was, uh, it was hot. She drank the Gatorade and she drank meth oil. Mouth immediately start, started burning. She started getting the effects of methamphetamine. What did her mother do? Start, let's start hiding the meth lab. Right. And so, um, she didn't go to the hospital with her daughter in the ambulance. She's like, Oh, I'll follow up. Um, I'll come after a minute. It's because she had to clean up the meth lab. We ended up doing a search warrant on her house. We found meth, meth equipment and chemicals in the dryer, the washing machine, the barbecue pit. We were out there like all night finding meth equipment and Marmaduke did the cook and she snitched him out. She said, you know what? This dude is the cook. And I said, okay, well I want the cook. Like you let them cook at your house. Your daughter's in the hospital. And I want Marmaduke. She goes, okay, I'll work with you. Remember I told you about them working with me? And this was like a beautiful woman had a job. She had two kids. Well, she did have a job. Now she's a meth addict. And she she totally dumped me, right, on helping me get Marmaduke. So I went over there. I'm like, hey, she won't answer her calls. I went over there, knocked on the door. She opened the door. There's a bunch of dudes sitting in her front um, living room. I'm like, uh, I need to talk to you. 
and she goes, oh, hang on a second. I seen a dude, um, like do something furtive on the couch. And I'm like, Hey, wh what are you doing? Cause I was concerned about weapons. Right. Well, he pulled out a bag of meth and he was trying to dump it in the couch cause he was getting nervous or scared. So I wrote a search warrant on the house again. This is like a month later in her safe. I find chemicals for making drugs. I found bags of marijuana that she's selling. I'm like, what are you doing? Like you have an opportunity. I want to cook and here you are selling drugs. So I gave her a third chance. I'm like, you know what? Like this is your last chance, man. I busted her once, busted her twice. I go, this is your last chance. So I guess it's a second chance, right? Second chance. What'd she do? She's thinking like ghosted on me. She left the state, took off, went into hiding. And then like a year or two later, I heard that she turned herself in when she was eight months pregnant in Arizona. Like, oh, I want to turn myself in. And she's pregnant. It's like, oh, good timing, right? So they went, they put her on trial. I went to trial. She told her story. The little girl that overdosed, that basically, she was nine years old. They had to strap her onto a gurney. She's fighting with the fire department. Like the mother didn't even call for help until her daughter was on the floor in the kitchen convulsing and basically like she was passing out, like she was overdosing from meth. Fire department shows up, ties her onto a gurney, puts her in an ambulance, takes off. And that's where her mom's like, oh, we got to clean this lab up, right? So I watch this little girl testify and her brother in court. And the little brother said, oh, my daughter, like for two weeks, or daughter, my sister for two weeks, she's like, um, all I, like all she did is chewed on her lip. Like she'd have to bring like a napkin or a, a washcloth to school because for two weeks she'd chew on her lip because of the effects of methamphetamine. And, um, guess what happened? The jury said, oh, this poor mother, like she was used. She's the victim. Like she's the victim in all this. We want Marmaduke, like bring him on. Well, we didn't have evidence. We no, I couldn't put Marmaduke there. Like I needed the mother to basically say, yeah, like he's the cook and I'll testify against him. She wouldn't testify against him. So Marmaduke is out there somewhere, man. And, uh, his number will come up someday, man. Karma, right? So that's just what happens. Like what mother would let that happen to her own children? She ended up losing her children. They went to live with their father in another state. But when I hear these stories and all that, like she started with just falling into this with this guy and seeing him and he turned her on to, he turned her on to meth and like he took her life from her, her children from her. Granted, she like went along willingly, but she was a really decent person that just went spiraling down. And I would see that on the search warrants with, with methamphetamine, like I've done hundreds of search warrants on meth users and dealers um, not the users, but the, the dealers and all the dealers were users unless it was cartel. Like all the, all the white meth cooks were basically start cooking so they could support themselves and then they would start selling to others. And that's pretty much, um, like how it worked. But, um, yeah, it was just, uh, a total mess. So, um, but these, on these search warrants, like these are like normal people that you go through all their stuff. Cause you know, they're, they hide their drugs everywhere and you see photo albums and you see where they, <coughs> where they were happy and living life. And now their life is just miserable shot. It's gone, you know? And again, even when they get treatment, like, like, look at this woman right here, Barbara Downey. Is she truly a former amphetamine addict or is she a current amphetamine addict and, and it's not, not even they call it amphetamine it's methamphetamine this is 1999 there was nobody using amphetamines in 1999 it was meth but media like rarely ever gets anything right so here's your high intensity user again this person here is uh remember high intensity year high intensity user they binge they tweak they crash they binge, they tweak, they crash. Average life expectancy of a high intensity user, 12 years. And remember that because it's going to be on the test, on the quiz. 12 years. Average life expectancy. There. 
So here's here's what a high intensity user looks like. And some of your binge users have these same um, these same characteristics: the severe weight loss, central pallor. Central pallor meaning like the blood is all like ready to run, fight. So they look really pale because the blood's not in their face; it's in their extremities, right? It's in their heart, in their lungs, like ready to just like <sighs> body odor, whew, sweating, bad teeth all the chemicals going through the mouth um, that just eat up the teeth and then they're not eating and their hygiene's poor and then the scars and open sores. So this is where we're going to break and we're gonna, you'll have your little quiz there and then we're going to move on to drug labs. So I'll see you on the other side.